Già? Sì. Mm-hmm. Va bene. Voi state bene? Tutto a posto? Tutto sì, bene, grazie. grazie. Abbiamo già tutto condiviso. Allora, per condividere è semplice, vedete sotto un pulsantino dove c'è scritto share screen. Sì. Ognuno di voi, ogni volta che vorrà, avrà la possibilità di eh, cliccare su quello, condividere la, ehm, l'applicazione che vuole condividere, ok? Perfetto. Mm-hmm. Ok, chi inizia? Inizia a Cesare. Cioè, allora, inizio io e faccio un'introduzioncina, poi okay. passo la palla a Cesare che fa la parte endoscopica e poi chiudo io con la parte tumore vascolare. Ok, perfetto, perfetto. Benissimo, Però, siamo, fai, dovremmo iniziare. Sì, sì, adesso vi, vi introduco al volo perché tanto stanno già entrando le persone, quindi ci siamo. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to our international panel. Today, we're going to be a little bit different, and uh, I'm involving some of my colleagues, uh, neurosurgeon colleagues, uh, which is are developing something new regarding fluorescein. So I requested them to talk about that, that the new stuff, basically, for, for us as an ENT, a rhino neurosurgeon. But they completely changed uh, their attitude and develop this new technique for uh, uh, fluorescein and I'm introducing them. Welcome Cesare Zoya and Daniele Bongetta. Good morning all. Hi. Good morning everybody. Morning to everybody. So, so today the, my colleagues uh, are respectively from... Um, Cesare, where are you from? Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm from uh, Pavia. I work in uh, San Matteo Hospital. Okay, and Daniele Bongetta. Good morning, Daniele. Where are you from? Good morning. I'm from the Fatabene Fratelli Hospital in Milan. So you're facing the emergency pretty bad right now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think both of us. Yeah, we are yeah. in long place, so yeah. it's, it's been a tough time. So um, today we are going, as usual, going through some uh, uh, videos and explanation. And uh, first, uh, a brief introduction regarding some updates and reviews regarding fluorescein and then we go deeply into that into that field so uh, please be aware that anyone that would like to join the, the conference is completely free by now you can also watch us on youtube and facebook and twitch uh, and uh, blah 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 so just leave the torch to cesare and daniele for their talk all the question at the end of the panel thank you so much So, who's going to start? I'm going to start. Okay, so Cesare is going to start. Please press the share screen whenever you want, and you will be able to share a presentation of yours. Yeah, actually, Great. start Daniele. Yes, it's me Perfect. first. So, Daniele is starting first. If you want, you can just... Uh, open the whole screen so we will not see others and the main focus okay. will be... You can see now? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit of an introduction about uh, the use of pressing in neurosurgery. And this, this is more or less what we're going to talk about. So a little bit of an introduction about fluorescein, which is a, a, an old drug, but has multi purposes and multiple use in uh, neurosurgery. Then we're going to go to... Um, the, the part of, uh, of Cesare, which is about endoscopic surgery, which has more links with the ENT surgeons, I think. And then we're going to switch back in uh, tumor surgery and vascular surgery, which are uh, new developments of this, uh, this kind of technique. So uh, let's begin with uh, uh, what is fluorescein and why is a multipurpose drug. So fluorescein is a, is a fluorophore, and the fluorophores are particular dyes that have uh, uh, some interesting uh, uh, optic characteristics. So they have uh, this feature by which they have an absorption spectrum, which is, uh, in the case of fluorescein, is around uh, 450 uh, nanometers, uh, which is a, um, a bluish light. And by applying this bluish light to uh, the fluorescein, they absorb this, this energy. And after a shift, which is a stoke shift, which is the shift that gives you the fluorescence, they emit a fluorescence in the shades of the green, a greenish, a greenish shade. So uh, the trick here is, is that if you uh, apply here a filter and uh, you, you push all your energy in the blue uh, wavelength and then you stop all this 
uh, from, from you, you will already uh, be able to see the greenish part and uh, to have a very uh, high contrast um, image of where the Florence scene uh, actually is. So um, it's not the only um, for a 404 and fluorescent dye used in uh, neurosurgery, also in other surgeries. So this is a, bit, a little bit of a recap of what is used right now. So there's fluorescent ICG, so green endogenin, and uh, 5-ALA. So um, there used to be a problem about uh, uh, FDA approval, but right now uh, 5LA has gained uh, uh, FDA approval. So um, all of them are cleared for, for use also in the US. And uh, the different issues are real-time visualization. Uh, fluorescent is, uh, is this one. So you can actually uh, employ it in uh, real time. You can see what you're doing. And actually you don't have to go back and forth in some, some kind of a, um, visualization, fluorescent or non-fluorescent, while ICG is forced to be recorded on a, a infrared camcorder and, and then replayed. And right now there are some, some new microscopes that uh, try to superimpose the two images, but it's not actually a real-time uh, visualization. And 5ALA, which is this, uh, can be viewed in real time, but is very dark and it's not that useful in real time uh, during uh, your surgery. Specificity is another issue, uh, obviously. And uh, by specific specificity, we mean that uh, how much does this dye tells us where the problem is, where the tumor is? Well, fluorescein is not a, a tumor dye, actually, but it, um, it's, it applies just like the, the gadolinium. It goes where uh, gadolinium goes. So where, in, for instance, in, in the brain, where the blood barrier is broken, broken by tumor. So it has some kind of specificity. If the blood, uh, blood barrier is broken, there should be some tumor there. And if it's uh, uh, enhanced by gadolinium, it's then enhanced also by fluorescein. ICG, on the contrary, has no uh, specificity whatsoever. It just stays in the, in the bloodstream. So it doesn't, doesn't die anything apart from vessels. And 5LA is the more specific of, uh, of all of them because it's uh, actually a, a dye which is metabolized by, by the tumor. Uh, high turnover cells, just like high, high, high tumor cells, uh, just like glioblastoma in, in the brain, for instance, they catch up the 5LA, they metabolize it, and the metabolite is that one that is fluorescent under the visualization. So it's very specific. Uh, this leads to some issues in administration timing, though, uh, because uh, fluorescein and ICG, they could be administered in repeatedly with no, no particular problem, while 5LA should be administered uh, way before, uh, usually the night before, and then you have some issues about the lighting, the patient should be kept uh, in a shadowy uh, area just to avoid some kind of photosensitization. So uh, this could be an issue. And uh, last but not least, the cost. The cost may be an issue, especially in some part of the, of the world. So for us, it's ultra cheap, five euros, ICG more or less 150, while 5LA is 900 euros, more or less depends on uh, which area you're uh, buying it with some royalty issues that we, we're gonna deal with uh, about later. So uh, just to give you um, a sample, uh, fluorescein is just like, you just have to imagine it just like gadolinium. Where gadolinium goes, fluorescein goes. Just because it, uh, their volume distribution is quite similar and they go to the interstitial space, to the third space. They ooze out of the, of the blood vessels and they deposit in the, in the in interstitial space. So um, it is a long story, the use of fluorescein uh, in neurosurgery. Actually, it, it, goes back, it goes back in uh, 1948 with Moore and, uh, and colleagues that they, they used high volumes of, of uh, uh, fluorescein, high dosages, and they watched it with no filtering system. Uh, it could be done, but it implies very, very high uh, doses of, uh, of fluorescein. And from the mid 90s and uh, the first years of the 2000, uh, there have been uh, an interest in using low doses of fluorescein, but with the aid of this filtering system. So let's apply a, a blue filter that enhances only the, the excitation part of the fluorescence, then a high pass filter, this one, to enhance the, the fluorescence in, in the field. So you see in this uh, seminal paper, they used a Kodak uh, filter, a photographic filter. Uh, so during my residency, I, I went to, to a Congress and it was in uh, 2013, I think, and uh, there was the, the first reported case of uh, fluorescence used in uh, neurosurgeon say, so why can it be done? I know in, in my department, uh, which I share with, with Cesare, uh, we had this, uh, this device, which is very common in ENT, uh, facilities, I think, uh, which is employed to um, evaluate uh, the fluorescence, the fluorescein via the, the nose for, for CSF leakage. I say, well, well I, I have the emission 
the emission part. What, what about the, the, the filter and the, the yellow filter? Why can't, can't I use the yellow filter and I can't see anything while I use the, uh, the patented one? Because the, the filter they employed is a very, very strict one, a very, very uh, cutting filter. So it just uh, it gives you a all or nothing situation. You, you cannot um, actually view in real time what you're, what you're doing. So I went back to the basics uh, and just, uh, design this, this, this kind of, of filtering systems. This is the, the filter actually from source for the blue filter. And then I went back and I just went to Amazon and uh, bought some very cheap filters uh, and modified them and modified them to, to fit both uh, or into the, the um, endoscope or to fit the oculars of the microscope. And uh, you can also use these, these oculars, which are very cheap too, it was from the well-renowned Decathlon store. Uh, they're used usually for cycling or for skiing. And uh, they're used to cut out, especially in very foggy, uh, foggy weather condition, to cut out the blue hue. So it's basically the same, the same principle. And this was our first patient. Uh, we tried to, to, to see if it was uh, possible to view. This is with normal view, with normal light. And this is with blue light and filtering system. And you can see, so you can spot mm, very, very nicely the contrast between what is fluorescent and what is not fluorescent. Uh, with this in mind, we published it. We published it, uh, our uh, whole uh, apparatus. And uh, we also uh, proudly deemed it a poor mass fluorescence because uh, there was a little bit of a dissing between uh, the five LA guys that were telling us that uh, uh, the fluorescing was a poor, uh, the poor man's uh, die for, for interoperative uh, uh, viewing. And we said, we, are, we were proud of it was a poor man, who is also poor man fluorescence uh, equipment right now to, to, to show that. And uh, it, it did have a little bit of a success. And this is basically the setup. We, we change the filter here for the endoscope, or we apply the filters here and we used the, the cable from the, for the, for the endoscope to and applied it to the headrest in, uh, of the of the patient while it was operated on. So this is more or less the, the setup, and you can use it. Uh, we know no handheld, but we also use it handheld with endoscope assisted surgeries in case of very small uh, incision, very small uh, approaches. So uh, which not much faster to do with what you see is actually is more or less just like the same. This is called the Netflix or Narcos FX. So in American movies, everything in Mexico is yellowish and more or less it's the same that happened in, in, in our view. So uh, right now I, I call uh, Cesare to, to show you some interesting uh, things in uh, ENT and transnasal uh, neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Daniela, for, for the introduction. I, I was fascinated by the, by the letter to the editor and the paper and I'm very, I'm very glad for 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 scientists to use uh, such a humility to say we have developed something that is uh, cost-effective, great, and should be available for everyone. This is this is very important. So the people should understand that if you if you're capable of finding something that is not commercially, how to say, commercially uncomparable to the other, but is uh, assumed to be part of your armamentarium why not using and that's how it goes so thank you once again Chester go ahead with your your talk thank you Puya you, you centered the point uh, it was amazing working with Daniele with uh, this idea that cost nothing and will be very useful uh, let's go back uh, to something that maybe is more familiar for uh, also for ENT and uh, that are uh, the normal using, we say normal, but is off level, of course, we know of fluorescein in neurosurgery or skull based surgery. So CSF leaks. Uh, CSF leaks are a big issue. And to detect them, we, we personally, we, we, we believe that, CS, that fluorescein is mandatory. Uh, we have, uh, 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 we could devise a cellix in spontaneous, iatrogenic and post-traumatic, of course. And um, we, we say that the surgery uh, should detect the point of uh, leak and then prepare them. This is our, uh, uh, we, we start from the clinical suspect. 
uh, and then we use fluorescein both in preoperative and in uh, intraoperative uh, situation. Uh, of course, CT scan and um, MRI can uh, give us uh, a suggestion where the point of leak is, but uh, the fluorescence is uh, very, very important to confirm it or to detect something new. Of course, uh, is not the topic of the talk. Uh, we have we can also speak about closing closure technique. It is a very interesting uh, topic. Basically, we we could uh, summarize in overlay technique and multi-layer, and but we, we, we can see something in the next slides, uh, slide. Uh, but uh, I I center the, the presentation just uh, to show the importance of fluorescing in. Uh, uh, skull base surgery and repairing defect and find it, find them. Uh, this is uh, a brief video of uh, an anterior uh, cranial fossa, uh, all exposed and then checked with the filter and with the blue light. And uh, as you can see, all the cranial fossa was fluorescent because there was no more bone and the dura was exposed and the leak was uh, fine in the entire uh, uh, anterior plant force. Uh, then, sorry. Then we, we can see, um, we have studied a little bit uh, the CSF leak, uh, spontaneous CSF leak in a clever region. This is a standard operation to repair them. And we find that uh, the Haddad flap the, is sufficient and very uh, useful. Uh, we are uh, now opening the sphenoid sinus to check where is the point of fistula. And uh, you can already see down there something greenish and now will appear with the filter. Of course, we have to expose better the defect, but before to open more the sphenoid sinus, we harvested the anadad flap that uh, could be also not so big because the, it's big enough, we, we can say. The, it uh, has to fit the defect, cover it all, but uh, we, we find that uh, too, too big is not uh, uh, useful. Uh, now we have harvested the flap and we, we put it down in the nasal pharynx. Here is something familiar with the drill. We enlarge a little bit the exposure and uh, we remove uh, then the mucosa on the CSF pistol. This is just to cauterize a little bit the point. And uh, after that, you will see also the mucosa. Uh, now we remove it laterally and then we put the, the flap in position. Here we go. We cover with some sponge and You can clearly see at the control at one year or more, I don't remember. This is perfect. So it's not about the flap, but you have seen that the fluorescein was very useful to detect the point of fistula. And uh, uh, as I say, the, the sides of the nasal flap, uh, we, we, we find that has been fit in relation with the size and the location of the defect. Of course, uh, if you have a bigger defect, you have to Harvest a, a bigger flap. And this is an interesting case where uh, the patient present to us with uh, uh, rhino library. And this is, was the pre -op, the pre -op images. You can see here the bony defect and here something. We, we find to, we, we, have, we, we thought to. To, to detect a necrodosis filizafra in re reality was a, a, a very small cordoma. It's not a topic, but you can see that uh, 
when we just touch the mucosa, the, we find the point of uh, leakage and uh, we can see in the back the posterior fossa with the basilar. Here we use also a little piece of uh, uh, taco seed that sometimes is useful, and of course we put them in the flat. We use also um, fluorescein in pituitary surgery uh, just to check uh, if we have uh, uh, take uh, all the tumor out because the normal gland, as Daniel will, will explain later, uh, is fluorescent and the tumor is not so fluorescent. And here you can see the normal gland uh, in the highest part of the field and uh, laterally the two cavernous sinus that are uh, visualized. Uh, I will show uh, this interesting case that we have uh, published because uh, sometimes uh, you have to keep in mind that also when the defect is very clear, uh, fluorescent, fluorescent can help you to detect something that you haven't seen. This was a, a very young man with a long history of uh, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma with uh, multiple uh, 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 radiation and chemotherapy. And uh, it presents uh, to, to us with uh, this uh, osteoradionecrosis and this fistula. Uh, that seems uh, very clear. This was uh, the pre-op CT. You can see no more uh, CSF inside the brain. And the defect is clear in, uh, in the clivus. So this is what we, we thought. Sorry. I, I got the problem with the presentation, sorry. So it's, it's, it's about uh, the, the video? No, no, it's not a video. It's just stopped. I will solve it. Uh, maybe if uh, Daniela, you could go ahead and then I show the case later. Thank yeah. you. So. I think that you have to upload your yeah, own. Yeah, yeah. OK. So we, we go a little bit uh, on and we talk about uh, high-grade tumor surgery, which is the hallmark of the use of fluorescein in uh, neurosurgery. Uh, just like in every tumor, but especially in uh, high-grade tumors in the, in the brain, we know that uh, even the smallest amount of residual tumor can make a difference in uh, uh, overall survival. So it's not a matter of how much, it's a, it's a matter of you took it away uh, in, in globally, took it away all, all the cells, all, all the stuff that should be, if you can, take away uh, in, in your surgery. So uh, this is a seminal paper by my friend Francesco Cervi from the Best Group, which they published in 2013, uh, their preliminary results, and they employed a, a low dose of fluorescein, five milligrams per kilo. Uh, and uh, with that, they were able to detect uh, fluorescein in inside uh, the brain in where, where the gadolinium is, just like just like I said before, and then multiple other uh, papers uh, being published. Uh, this one is uh, from the same group that their trials Floblio, and I would like to to remark you that there have been no adverse reaction related to SF administration. So it's a very very safe drug. It's well known from very long time. The only potential problem, but very rarely, is allergic problems. And uh, remarkably, sensitivity and specificity is about 80.8 and 79, which is remarkable if you recall uh, what I was saying before. So it's not a tumor specific lesion, but it has a, a remarkable sensitivity and specificity. So uh, from then we moved on and I, I had the pleasure to work with Cesare on this. We, we, we made our own trial, which is uh, glioma, and we tried to, to, to see if we could have the same results with our uh, with our methods, with our low-cost methods. And I show you some, some interesting uh, cases. Well, well what, what we learned, what we, we were doing. So this is a case of a frontal, right frontal uh, glioma. And this is the operative video. Sorry for this, a little bit of a lagging. 
And uh, when we switch on the fluorescent, you can see that is a, a clear view of the, where the fluorescent is. So this has, this allows us to uh, be fast. To this has speeded up our, our surgery a lot. So you you are sure that you are doing right. You are sure that you are uh, targeting what you what you have to do. You are not sucking away uh, functional brain. You are not sucking away unwanted things. And this translates in, in, intuitively in a, in a great advantage for the patient and also for the surgeons. Well, when we began that, we, we were, uh, I was actually doing my PhD, so we weren't um, what you define experienced neurosurgeons, but that allowed us to, to, to perform surgery in a very, very fast and safe, safe ways and boosted our confidence in that what we were doing was, was safe and, and we were right in what we were doing. Another thing is uh, um, once you have performed your surgery, uh, you're really sure that you have finished your, your surgery. So we see that even just even a difference between 98% and 100% of cells taken away, of tumor taken away. So once you switch on the, the, the fluorescing at the end of your surgery, with, uh, uh, with the pettis, you, you sucked up the blood and you could see here little spots of, oh, sorry, little spots here, here, and here of little remnants of tumor. And that's maybe very trivial, but it's not, especially in a very high grade, uh, high grade tumors. And it could be translated also, I think in, in all uh, head and neck tumors. So you, if you have to be radical, you have to be radical. You don't have to leave anything behind. And or, uh, if not, your, your uh, extent of resection will have an impact on overall survival. So another thing that we used it on is on uh, remnants or um, evolutions of lower grade glioma. So here you can see this is a, a lower grade part here and a higher grade here with a very um, you know, relevant vascular structures, the, the MCA, the middle cerebral artery here. So we have to be extra careful in, in, in what we're doing. Here is an example of combined with Cesare, which is the, the master of the endoscope, which is holding right now the endoscope. And you could see with a very small incision, here it is, fluorescence. This is what we have to take out. This is not what we have to take out. And this is our artery. So it, it boosts your confidence, it boosts your, your proudness, it boosts your, your skills. Uh, and it's very cheap. So that, I think that this is the more, most important take home measure. So why not use it why, while it gives you um, more, um, uh, it's just like using the neural navigation, you know. You can do it without neural navigation. All, all the, the past surgeons did it without neural navigation since uh, the, the, the dawn of time. But once you've got it, you, you have to use it because it gives you confidence. And uh, also medical legal grounds, it's good to have something that helps you. So uh, with these trials, uh, the, the Blaster one and, the, and ours, uh, it has been an evolution also in the Italian pharmacy agency, which has actually allowed it, even though it, it was an exception, but now it's not for uh, oncologic, uh, being used in the fluorescent as an oncologic tracer in uh, neurosurgery. Uh, other groups too, also Benevento group, for instance, and other groups in uh, Germany, in the United States, have evolved in uh, using this uh, kind of technique. And this is an, also an interesting low cost uh, device from colleagues from Singapore. They use this, this uh, pen, which is uh, uh, actually used for detecting the fluorescence in Scorpios. You know, the, the little Scorpios. You have a note of fluorescence and you can, you can track them with the blue lights. They bought it, it's also on Amazon. <laughs> you bought some filter, you put them on and you can see in real time while you do a biopsy, if the biopsy you've made it, it's where the gadolinium is. So I made a biopsy and it's, it's in a good place. So you have a, a, a higher line, in, high sensitivity in your uh, biopsy procedure because you in real time you can say well i got it at least i got it not not everybody not every every uh, situation you have a pathologist and you can do with a pathologist the confirmation of your of your uh, biopsy so i think that is quite good and it's been employed also in other tumors just uh, as peripheral nerve sheet tumors this is quite recent so this is the demonstration is also evolving this this technique uh, all the publications are from the 2019 and also from the best group also uh, in, in a way that you can enhance the tumor by sparing with lower doses uh, the actual nerve fibers. So you can, uh, this is a little bit, there's a debate ongoing in this, uh, in this thing, but you can actually quite um, distinguish what the tumor is and what the tumor is, uh, uh, where the nerve is. So in, once again, it helps you to have better eyes, uh, another set of eyes, uh, fluorescent ones, to, to uh, acknowledge what's going on in your surgery. Petitra adenomas, as introduced by, by Cesare, uh, 
because of his, his, uh, his skills and his experience in this, uh, this surgery, we will try to, uh, to analyze if there could be possibly a, a, a use for this, uh, this surgery, this, this, this technique and also in pituitary surgery. And it turns out it's quite complex because of the pituitary uh, um, angio architecture. Yeah, we all know that it's a retina mirabilis with uh, adenohypophysis, which is very different in vascularization between uh, um, in regards with uh, neural hypothesis. And uh, there's lots of uh, interstitial space between cells. And when you have adenomas, uh, not all adenomas have the same amount of interstitial space. And moreover, moreover as they are uh, tumors, they have an angiogenetic, uh, newly angiogenetic uh, structure. So. Once you uh, apply your, your dye, the, the actual uh, blushing of the fluorescence is uh, um, very, very fast. And uh, what, what we envision is was, what that, uh, just like in the dynamic uh, MRIs that you do for, for instance, in concussion disease to, to uh, acknowledge that there is uh, an adenoma, all the pituitary comes fluorescent because of the interstitial, but lots of interstitial there, but the adenoma does not because of different uh, angio architecture. So we, we design a, uh, and we won a grant actually with, with that. And we, we're gonna, we put it a little bit aside because they changed the hospital and stuff like that, but we're gonna uh, be on, on this topic in the next few months. And uh, this is a case, a pilot case. You, you see the adenoma is not fluorescent, the, the pituitary is, and uh, the doing interpretive video, uh, Chisley just scooped out the adenoma here, which is not fluorescence. And this is the, re the, the, the residual part of the normal uh, hypothesis, the normal pituitary. Uh, and you can see that it, it is a very vivid greenish uh, lighting up. So this could be useful. I mean, we're gonna try to um, correlate this also with uh, the MRI. So we're gonna make uh, um, MRI, uh, MRI uh, dynamic MRI and also a late phase MRI to see if there's also a late phase catching up of the, of the dye in the pituitary uh, area. And uh, last but not least, the vascular surgery. Vascular surgery uh, has been um, employed for resting in the late part because we have, we have ICG, you know, ICG is, is very good in, in visualizing the, the, uh, the vessels. But uh, lots of big players for the neurosurgical parts, Baikosi, Loton, Nakaji, uh, they also embrace the use of fluorescing because it, it may show some advantages. It, it better visualize deep location, and most of all, you can do uh, a visualization in real time. So you know what you're doing, you don't have to wait and see what, what was happening there. And uh, there's also some differences uh, in uh, the way you administer. Some guys have administered in, with the uh, intra-arterial uh, um, pressing, but we also we, we always use the intravenous one. We think it's a safer one and we had quite good results, but it's more of a technicality. This is a patient I operated on, which has two aneurysms, uh, one in the carotid, one in the mesocerebral artery, which are shown here. And uh, this is what we, uh, we did with the use of fluorescence. So uh, we go down with an endoscope, so it's an endoscope assisted uh, neurosurgery. And this is the clip. Uh, well, let's see right here. This is the clip that closes this little tiny aneurysm. Here you can spot, and it's gonna be more clear, the uh, optic nerve, and this is the carotid coming up. So uh, I speed up the video. We inject the fluorescine, and right now it's gonna became fluorescent, the, the vessel part, here it is. So it's coming up. It's coming up with a little bit of oozing right here. It's coming up. And this is the other aneurysm with, which we already clipped. And you can see the trifurcation of the middle cerebral artery is vividly green. And we, we would have preferred that the aneurysm would have not uh, had this leakage, but it has a little bit of a leakage, very, very little bit of a leakage, which could be uh, potentially detrimental in the long term. So what we did with uh, with this information in mind is that we put another clip, another stacking clip behind to reinforce the closing of this aneurysm. And this is uh, basically what happened. So during this phase of the video that you've shown, the mm, trifurcation is very vividly green. So the pressing passes through a little bit of a oozing. And after that, we put another clip here the trifurcation is uh, uh, cleared from fluorescent, but the aneurysm is very, very, very vividly green. And that's because we closed the aneurysm, so there is no washout. And this is a confirmation that we, we excluded the aneurysm. And uh, the, the postoperative angiography 
just show what, what we've seen in real time. So we were very confident that we did a, a good job in closing up the, the annual report. Another application, uh, which is a pilot case, was in uh, capernomas. So capernomas, we know that are uh, occult vascular uh, lesions, so they do, do not catch up the eye. Uh, the MRI, also the angiogram, they catch up in uh, developmental venous uh, anomalies, and this is the case. And we wanted to try if that's the same case, just uh, uh, with gadolinium also in uh, in real time with fluorescein. And here again is Cesare doing uh, all the work in holding up the, the filters, and uh, we're going to uh, do uh, endoscope-assisted uh, neurosurgery. And we see here, this is the developmental thing anomaly and the cavernoma right here. And when we suck up some CSF, you can see that this is a very clear definition between what is non-occult, so the DDA and the cavernoma itself. And this is a still image so just to, to make a comparison. So the cavernoma is not catching up the fluorescence while the DDA is catching up fluorescence. This is not one of my cases actually, it's an AVN cases, just to say that in the application of resin has been used also in other vascular uh, procedures. And this is uh, the last slide to, to show you that uh, Japanese are well ahead of our times and right now they are developing new technologies, which is uh, laser uh, blue filtering. And you can appreciate here how much of a detail you have with fluorescent. This is unthinkable with any other dye, uh, even with the ICG. So you have a real time visualization with a super fine definition even of the capillaries in the, in, the, in your surgical field and you can have uh, d d basically there is no um, learning curve it's it's just intuitive you go for there and it, it colors up and you know what you're doing just by applying this uh, this fluorescence so just concluding it's it's a safe cheap uh, drug uh, cheap using that the, work the workflow is very easy you have a real-time visualization it's versatile for tumor for vascular also for ENT as Cesare will, will show now other application. And it's an old drug, but technology is evolving. So if you're interested in this, please feel free to email me or, or ask for something uh, at the end of this presentation, but also check out the literature because the, the field is evolving and there are gonna be some, some new technology advancement in the, in the near future. So I ask Cesare to, if yeah. you, thank you. Thank you, Daniela. This is the video of the first operation of the guys we saw before. We just uh, find the point of fistula where we think was the only point of fistula. We harvest a bigger, in this case, other flap, and we put it uh, in the nasal pharynx in this standard fashion. And then we drill a little bit of the uh, sphenoid and the posterior part of the septum, and we expose the, the bone into this complete uh, necrotic. And we, we thought, okay, we have exposed the defect. We see that it's there. We just put the uh, flap on, with a bit of glue and so on, and we have done. And for two days, it was okay, but after two days, uh, start again to uh, to leak, and this is, was the second operation. We decide to put some fluorescein uh, through a lumbar puncture in a standard fashion, and we see that comes from above. So we have to discover wait, wait. a little bit more of the sphenoid and all the mucosa. Wait, wait Cesare, we have we are facing some issues. It's the images is not uh, shared. Oh, sorry. Sharing this part. Okay. Let's now see. you see. Nope. Still not. Okay. It, it, can you see that, Daniele? No. No. So. Okay. I go back, share screen, and now yes. 
So you have seen not, you, have, you don't see the second operation, this one, of course, or also the first. Uh, we well, start here, I guess. In the second operation, we harvest uh, uh, the, a contralateral uh, that flap, so a second flap. We take the first back and we discover the defect and the fluorescing come from above. And thank you to fluorescing where we, we, we find the real point of fistula that was uh, covered by mucosa. And uh, we put two flaps, one above and one uh, to more uh, uh, caudally, and we can save because we can see the, the save the patient life. This is an early post op with some costosity, of course, and you see the, the two flex cover or the entire clibus and the sphenoid. Uh, we have uh, used also fluorescence, uh, fluorescence in a couple of uh, other things so that maybe more ENT things. You know, we see the names, we uh, collaborate with the ENT guys of Pavia, and this is, they are very experienced in the HHT, uh, so hemorrhagic telangiectasia. We have find that sometimes with the fluorescence you have a better view of where to cauterize uh, all the, uh, the point of bleeding. And the other things we, we have published is just uh, a check on the other flap. We, we know that sometimes the other flap could be uh, could necrotize because I have problems in uh, vascularization. And so we have a, a direct check if the flow goes through the uh, pedicle of the flap. And you see that uh, at the beginning, the green is just in the pedicle and then goes up till the end here. And so uh, we have a confirmation of our uh, vascularization of the flap, so the, flesh, the flap is uh, alive, and we we are. This is another case, smaller flap, but you see the pedicle is well injected by fluorescence, so it means that it could be vascularized and the perfusion is uh, safe. So this was the last two application of our technique and uh, of the different uh, filter. And I would like to thank you, Puya, and thank you, Daniele, for sharing with us uh, this experience. Now we are, of course, here for all the questions. And uh, yeah, you. we have we have some. We have some. Of course, uh, this time we we have in uh, participant not only from ENT field but also neurosurgery. But I think that you can manage it well. The first question is uh, from the guys from Brazil, and do do they see? Would you use it preoperatively? Uh, in in uh, um, in CSS uh, detection, yes. We use also preoperatively, especially if uh, there is no clear point of fistula on the CT or MRI. Uh, in other uh, issues, of course not. It's, it is an intraoperative, uh, very useful technique. And you give uh, five milligrams plus or minus of fluorescence per kilo at the beginning of the anesthesi anesthesiology part of the operation. And, and the same question is, uh, can you do it preoperatively and not during surgery? Uh, yes, and CSF is possible, of course. And if you find the, a clear point of fistula and you can recognize it with, without any doubt, it's, you can do it. But uh, I think it's always better to have also intraoperative fluorescing. Uh, because can add something, especially when there is maybe uh, some doubt, uh, two point of fistula, and so on. Um, this is the other question is from uh, guys from Japan. This is for Daniela. They say, uh, are you do you need desensibilization prior to using fluorescein in case of uh, um, sensibility to contrast? Uh, actually, no. No, it's uh, it's more or less just like the um, gadolinium, which has very very rare uh, side effects in terms of allergies. 
So it's not a iodine uh, thing. It's uh, it ways of metabolization is glucuronized on the liver and it's uh, uh, eliminated in the next 24 hours uh, uh, urinary. So we didn't have any and uh, the largest series with these doses haven't had any. Uh, just keep in mind that it's uh, routinely used without any anesthesia for ophthalmic procedures. And they use four times the doses that we use. So it's a super safe, uh, super safe thing to use. Uh, I want to point it out that um, one of the potential confounders of its use uh, in case of sensitization. So I, I, I recall the use of uh, uh, cortisone, for instance, that you, uh, the use of cortisone or manitol or something that opens up the blood brain barrier in the immediate preoperative time uh, is to be avoided just to avoid uh, false positives. So, but in, in, as far as uh, side effects goes, the only real side effect, if you call it that, is that the sclera of the eye becomes yellowish. But you just tell to the patient and to the relatives, and you, you see your bag of urine is gonna be very green, but yellowish, and that's it. It's like the test, the DIA test that we're doing to detect flourishing inside of the nostril for yeah, 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 yeah. like on the DCR, I guess. Yeah, it is. yeah. The only, th the only thing that I would like to point out is uh, when it goes on your clothes, it will never get out. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So use gloves, <laughs> use gloves, and and be very, very, very afraid of resin dye. That's true. Another question that comes from France uh, is. Uh, uh, can we see any, if we see any, any fluorescein when we harvesting the Hadad flap, uh, would it be necessary to reopen it or we can just uh, think that it was the residue? If we do not see the fluorescein or? I think that they, what they want to know is yeah. that you, um, when, you, when you cover the defects yeah. and then you see a small amount, I think that it's the residual part, it's not like a leakage. I think ah, yes, of course. Uh, of course, in the nose, that there is some bleeding. And so uh, you have to point uh, your focus on the, on the pedicle of the flap and to see the, the fluorescence. But uh, if you stay there for a long time, of course, in the border, you can find some fluorescence uh, and you just blood because uh, it can, came out. Um, the, the important thing, and if you do not see the, the fluorescence in the flap, or is a, a matter of, uh, of uh, re, re, re harvest the flap and positioning in another way, maybe there is uh, a kinking of the pedicle, or the flap is already dead. So think of to use the other flap uh, if possible, or to use something to reinforce your plastic because uh, it's not uh, gonna be so sure, so safe as uh, the flap is uh, leaving. There's a question from Germany, which is uh, interesting, but I'm not sure because I'm not a never, pretty narrow surgeon. It's, it's fascinating. Is the lumbar drainage will change the behavior or the aspect when you're doing the fluorescein? No. I, I, don't, I don't get what they want to know because... Uh, uh, I mean, if there is, uh, if you um, put the fluorescein in the CSF for ENT stuff or CSF leakage and so on, uh, it just... Uh, Go, um, came out uh, a little bit faster. If there is a lumbar drainage and you put the, the fluorescence intravenously, uh, there is no, no difference because it's another uh, way to uh, put the, the, flores, the fluorophore in the, in the body, so intravenously, and uh, the fluorescence is uh, uh, just uh, detected uh, where uh, the blood bank, blood bank barrier is uh, broken. So the, the lumbar drainage is not uh, a problem. If you have to use it, uh, no problem. Are you agree? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, definitely because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's already behind, below uh, uh, the, the, the threshold of, of what you have in, uh, in the oozing of, of fluorescence. So you have the fluorescence that comes out of the, of the vessel 
goes in the residual space, and then from that it goes in the CSF and out in the uh, from your lumbar drain. So um, the deposit of of, of your uh, fluorescence it happens. We usually use it at, at just at the beginning of the of the uh, intubation when you when you um, put the tube down the, the throat of the patient. You administer the fluorescence, and then it's it then that becomes to to have the an oozing on the interstitial space. So if after that you have to put your lumbar drain or you do an extensive uh, a drain of CSF uh, in the system, for instance, it, it doesn't really affect anyway the, the, the oozing of the rate of uh, how much fluorescence is going to be in the interstitial space. So it's not a problem. We have two more questions. The first from Egypt. Would you still uh, requesting better trace? Uh, yes, of course. Better trace uh, remain a, a, a milestone in the pre-op uh, uh, for a CSF leak, because if bed trace is negative, it's very, very unuseful that there is a CSF fistula. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes the patient cannot give you sufficient uh, liquid. Uh, we don't know if it's CSF or uh, other uh, uh, to, to search for beta trace. And so you can perform a pre-op uh, uh, fluorescein test and uh, if positive, then you go for operation. Another one from Germany is, uh, are you prescribing on the surgical consent to the use of fluorescing? Yeah, when we, well, actually, we, we can, we are allowed to use that. We, we have to keep trace there on the patient we use that. And when we, uh, we sign uh, our informed consent, we use intraoperative dyes, just fluorescence, just like fluorescence. Okay, last one from Saudi Arabia. What are the situation if you have small leakages from a different part of the anterior skull base in close to each other? Uh, if we, we just um, check with the fluorescence, if every point is fluorescent and uh, CSI come out, we just uh, uh, cover it uh, with an overlay technique, usually in the anterior cranial fossa. Uh, and we cover all the defect. Uh, if uh, the defect are bigger, maybe we use also the flat. So there's many questions. I have to be honest. The people are asking so many. So if you don't mind, as always, I'm, I'm telling our audience to send a personal email to you to ask more questions. We don't have enough time to cover all these aspects. For what I understood, there's uh, a lot of people uh, requesting information because uh, it seems uh, pretty amazing how does it work, especially some of them were interested in the vasculature uh, from the neurosurgical perspective more than ENT. I like the, 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 the field for the nasal septal vascularization and how to detect and what to do, really, really impressive. So I, I really think that could help a lot with this, uh, some, you know, a little work and some uh, tips and tricks that you have to do, which you uh, that you just said. So as you can see, Chesser is already putting his uh, his email on on a chat over here. I will put it on Facebook and YouTube for anyone who's interested. So. Thank you, Cesare. Th thank you, Daniele. For those who don't know, unfortunately, before the lockdown, we were supposed to have uh, um, the first microsurgical course that was uh, developed over here in Perugia. Um, Cesare and Daniele were actually uh, uh, amazingly uh, planning the whole schedule that was, uh, um, that was assessed for March. Unfortunately, we couldn't... Uh, have done it, but we will do it in the future. For so, sure. if anyone sure. is in, and, I, and I'm I'm very glad about this collaboration. And another thing that I would like to um, suggest for anyone interested, there's uh, there's an um, Instagram page where you can see a lot of skull base procedure. It's called skull base endoscopy. Also on Facebook, so you can go there and check a lot of cases, surgery and stuff like that. So. Um, Last question, just at the end, this one, it is possible to see the lecture on YouTube? Yes, you can see all the lectures, previous lectures, future lectures on YouTube, on Facebook, and we're also on Twitch. We are going to see some beautiful new things. If we can do 
one thing as soon as you will be back Danielle and Cesare in the lab we can do like a live a video where you can show to the people how to 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 project the glasses and the, and the how to do oh. the edits so we will have more you know a do it yourself stuff okay okay so thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Cesare. Before closing the remarks, I would like to invite everyone for the next few meetings that we are going to have uh, in, uh, in, in this week and next week. We cannot say what are going to be the next ones for in two weeks. Just let me share this one. Hold on a second. All right. So the first event that we are going to have is tomorrow and we are going to have an anatomical dissection from uh, Professor Prepageran is the infratemporal fossa approach and Meckelscave on Friday GPA and role of otorolingologist with Shokad Abdullah Rahman then next week on Monday we are going to have uh, Anderson Eloy with extending endoscopic and open sinus surgery for refractory chronic sinusitis then we are going to have another topic which is completely different from the medical aspect but it's very helpful for the how companies can remain competitive in new in the new world paolo is a friend of mine is a part of the imperial college being a school it's, you will have some some tips and tricks and we're going to have uh, anna joshua with a deviated uh, nose the functional aspect and then the master for the minimalism in invasive retrosigmoid approach uh, professor Magnan was my, one of my mentor he's going to talk with indication and techniques sorry for bothering you all Thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Cesare. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And I really hope to you. see you very, very, very soon. For those who are interested, check out the uh, NASA Sano page. And we are going to let anyone know as soon as we can for the microsurgical dissection course. One place is for free for the ERS nurse and also for another uh, association that we will tell you about. Thank you so much, and I'll see you tomorrow for everyone, and I'll talk to you, Daniel and Cesare, very soon. Bye.